And so let's turn in our Bibles quickly. I don't want to lose the audience this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Probably, in my opinion, it is the most important chapter in the New Testament concerning eschatology. Who said that? Okay. Well, that's my opinion. You'll see why in a few moments. So let us pray. It's going to be one of those mornings. I can see it coming. Uh, let us pray. I, I promise you it won't take me more than two hours to get through this chapter. So just fasten your seatbelt or unbuckle them, whatever you have to do. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And Lord, truly, I do thank you for the confusion, for the false teachers, as it were, that tried to infiltrate this fledgling church, not more than a year old, and bring in false teaching so that Paul, the great apostle of grace, would have to write back to them and lay out in probably the clearest terms the chronology of the things that are just before us today, the time of deception that we would be in, the removing of the church, the, what goes on during the tribulation period with the Antichrist, the returning of Jesus with the church to establish his millennial reign. It's all before us. And then in, in the DNA of this chapter is woven into it how people in these last days will be deceived. And there's a warning about it. And so, Lord, just speak to our hearts this morning, we pray. Give us understanding and then permanency to that understanding, we would ask. In the mighty name of Jesus, we would pray and all God's kids would say, amen. amen. Let me start our lesson this morning by saying, today could be the day. What's the reason? <laughs> amen. You know, we are living in the last days. And I don't say that lightly. I know that Calvary Chapel... Um, when it was formed back in the 60s, that our pastor Chuck, you know, brought eschatology, as it were, back to the forefront of the church. He also brought back expositional teaching, teaching through the Bible, not from the Bible, verse by verse. And we're so thankful to Pastor Chuck, who the Lord saw fit to take him home back in 2013. I miss him. But yes, we do. We miss him. And, you know, if you've noticed, we've been ending our services lately with the Spirit song. You know, it just reminds me of his radio station. You know, whenever you'd hear that song on the radio, you knew Chuck was coming on, and you were going to get a verse-by-verse, -verse, clear, concise, and simple understanding of the Word. Well, that's what I want to give you this morning. So if you're a note-taker, get your pad and pen out. There's several things that we want to make note of as we work our way through this chapter. And listen, I don't know if we're going to get through the whole chapter this morning or part of the chapter. We'll just see how the Holy Spirit leads. But there's some things that are in this chapter that are extremely important. Uh, number one... Paul is going to remind us as he opens up these passages that there are people who would try to deceive you about the blessed hope. In fact, Peter says, in the last days, scoffers will come, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers have fallen asleep, all things have continued the same. And they're not. In fact, he goes on to say they're willingly ignorant. Because in the days of Noah, God interrupted human history. He stepped into it as it were, because the sin of the people became so great back in Noah's day that God even repented that he'd made man. I think we're about there again. And so God stepped in, interrupted, and destroyed the world that was then by a flood, and yet we're told in the scripture that the world is now is reserved for the same judgment, only this time by fire. And so it, it behooves us as Jesus warns us, to know the day, to know the time, to know the seasons that we're living in. So let me just go back to 1 Thessalonians, if you will, for a moment. I want to read you chapter 5 again, because this is so important. And watch the pronouns. Very important. He says there, as he's writing the first letter to the Thessalonians, which, by the way, as we've said, is the earliest of the Pauline epistles. It's the first letter that Paul wrote. Paul was there for three Sabbath days, four weeks, and a riot followed him from Philippi, drove him out of the city. He flees to Athens. When he gets to Corinth, he understands the church is still doing well. He writes back to them, and every one of the chapters, all five of them, end with Paul reminding this fledgling church about the return of Jesus Christ to come to take his church home. That's always the blessed hope. That should always be the focus of the church. But watch the pronouns that we just read through the, part, the first part of this chapter. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, 
You see, it sets up chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. No man knows the day of the hour, and I, 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 don't, I don't know it either. But I do know the times and the seasons that we're living in because I'm a student of the Word. I'm a student of prophecy. The key indicators that we're living in the last of the last days is that Israel will be birthed again as a nation, and they would have control of the holy city of Jerusalem. We've seen that in our lifetime. And the things are going on in the Middle East right now as we did our prophecy update. Listen, the power structure is mo moving from the west to the east, if you haven't paid attention. All of the things needed to build the next temple. This is not the millennial temple that we studied on Wednesday night in Ezekiel chapter 40. But there's a new temple coming in which the Antichrist will defile. Listen, the red heifers to cleanse it. The rabbis have already trained the priests to occupy it. Listen, they already collected all of the materials to construct it. And they think they have the Eunuka, the Messiah, the false Christ. They, they're, they're saying in Israel, I'm not saying this, they're saying it, that we found the Messiah. These are all indicators. But watch what he says. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, I have no need that I write unto you. For you, for, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. That's why I'm spending time warning you. And I'm hoping that as we spend all of this money over the airwaves, radio, you know, our live stream, YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, our website, we are wanting to warn as watchmen on the wall in these last days. We want to sound the alarm that, listen, we are living in the latter days. We are living in the final moments of the church. And, and I would say it again, that Ray Charles who was blind, in his current state, which is dead, would understand that. You would have to be asleep in the light. But it will come suddenly, and it will come unexpectedly. Now watch the pronouns. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a, child, uh, upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not of darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light. You are the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, they sleep in the night. They that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for the helmet, the hope of our salvation, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, over and over, you hear this false teaching today. Paul's going to address it in his chapter 2, that the church is going through the tribulation. Nothing can be more than a lie from the pit of hell. You don't beat up your bride before you take them to the merry supper of the Lamb. You have not been appointed unto wrath. You will never face the wrath of God. Jesus propitiated your sin, as 1 John tells us in chapter 2. What does that mean? He satisfied any emotion that the Father had against you, and He became the payment, the expiation for your sin. That's why in Romans chapter 5 it says, Having been justified by faith, you now have peace with God. God will never be angry with you again. And just like he did in the days of Noah, he removed the righteous and then he destroyed the wicked. Just like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah, he removed righteous lot and he destroyed the wicked. And he's about to do it again in the times we're living in. He's going to remove the righteous and he's going to deal with the wicked. It's the whole 70-week vision of Daniel. It stopped at 69 weeks. And then this thing that Paul called a mystery, hidden in times past, called the church was open wide because they rejected the Messiah. And when the church is taken out, then that last seven-year uh, period of time, that last week, the clock will tick back to dealing with Israel. That's why Jeremiah calls the tribulation Jacob's trouble. The church has nothing to do with it. But now there's some false teaching that's been going on. And so Paul has to address it. And so we read there in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Let's turn there. He said, Now we beseech you, brethren... I want you to notice the grammatical structure in the Greek. So important. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was promised. Jesus said in John chapter 14, listen, let not your heart be troubled. 
Listen, as we look around, disconnect from this world. Turn off your TV, even turn off Fox News. Because it's connecting you with the distress of this world, which is prophesied. We're going to see that this morning. It's going to get worse and worse. God is setting this world up for his judgment. But we know that we're not appointed under wrath. We're going to be redeemed. And so he's saying to this, listen, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming. Just let me finish John 14 before I get starting to preach instead of teach. Listen. This is the promise. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming again to receive you unto myself that where I am, you might be also. That's a promise given to the church. Can I get an amen? Man, we're about to go home. How many would like to have a seven-year meal and you don't gain any weight? That would be so cool. Listen, now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and notice the chi, the K-A-I in the Greek. It's a connective term. By the Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto him. What is Paul talking about here? This is not the second coming. The second coming, we come with Christ. We're going to read that this morning in Revelation chapter 19. We come with Christ. A sword proceeds out of his mouth. He destroys his enemy in the Valley of Megiddo at the Battle of Armageddon. He sets up his millennial reign. And the temple we've been studying about that will, he will build during the millennial reign, that's where he will reign from. He's talking about the rapture. How do we know that? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Again, as Paul is writing this same church, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, and here's our word for rapture, will be caught up. It's harpazo in the Greek. In the Latin, that word is you know, it's, in, it's translated rapture. That's why we use the, the word in, the, in, in, you know, in our vernacular today because it comes from the Latin Vulgate. But in our modern English, it would be caught up. It means to be snatched away with violent force. You know, Paul talks about in a moment in a twinkling an eye, this corruption put on incorruption. It'll, it'll, it'll be pretty radical. He says, then we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now notice the rapture, we go to meet him in the air. At the second return, he comes down, puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, it splits, he roars as a lion, because now he is coming, not as the Lamb of God, but he's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah to set up his reign. Two different events described differently. And then he says, so shall we be with the Lord forever. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, he says, behold... I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall be changed. In a moment and in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first incorruptible and we shall be changed. Paul is talking here about the catching away of the church. And in the first three centuries of the church, they had one view of eschatology. It wasn't until Constantine conquered, became the next Roman emperor, and he brought in, because he used the Christians in the Christian vernacular conquer, he brought in and made the Roman Catholic Church, which is an oxymoron, because Catholic means universal. He made the Roman Catholic Church the state religion, and because peace came, they started this whole teaching of all millennialism, they started this whole teaching corrupting what the early church believed. The early church always believed that Jesus would come for his bride. She would be whisked away to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which lasts seven years. And then his bride would return with him to establish his millennial reign. At the end of the millennial reign, Satan would be loosed for a short season. Fire would come down from heaven, destroy them, and then a new heaven and a new earth. And so Paul lays this out very clearly for us in this single chapter. It's amazing. So he's telling us, listen, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that you be not so soon shaken, disturbed is the idea, shaken in mind, or troubled, 
uh, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as the day of the Lord, or the day of Jesus Christ is at hand. Now that word at hand means current. You see, because of the tribulation that was going on that was coming from the Roman Empire, false teachers were coming and saying, we're in the tribulation. Look what's going on. And Paul says, there's deception. We left and these false teachers came in. And they're teaching you that you're in the tribulation. And they're saying that we had wrote letters concerning this, which we never wrote. They're saying that they're speaking for the Lord, which they are not. They're saying that it comes from the Spirit, which it hasn't. And so there's deception afoot. In fact, Jesus said when he was asked what would be the sign of his coming and the end of the world in Matthew chapter 24, the very first thing he mentions is deception. In fact, when Jesus taught the parable about the ten virgins that went out to meet the bridegroom, he said, five wise, five foolish. But all ten of them needed to be awakened so that they were ready for the bridegroom to come. The five wise had extra oil, which is always a type of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is having to address something that is very serious. Paul is having to address something that's being corrupted by false teachers, by false prophets. He's having to deal with something where they're actually lying that Paul said something he never said or wrote something he never wrote. And so Paul has to write back, to defend this view of eschatology of a preacher rapture followed by the return of Jesus Christ after seven year tribulation to establish his millennial reign. And he will do it in a masterful way. I think, you know, in the most masterful way, we get the, the greatest understanding of the chronology. Like I said, that's why I think that the second chapter of Second Thessalonians is by far and away the greatest chapter in all the New Testament on eschatology. Now watch what he says. He says, let no man deceive you. You know, we have a varied views. Uh, you know, some people will say, well, we don't study uh, eschatology. We don't study prophecy um, because nobody can understand it. Jesus said that you should understand it. Paul thinks you should understand it. He's in the city for four weeks in a total, and, he, and he's going to tell him, when I was with you, I told you these things. You see, Genesis is how we got here. And the rest of the book, all the way to Revelation, is what we need to do while we're here. And Revelation is where we're going. This is not your home. Understand that. After the fall, this is not your home. We are sojourners. We're pilgrims. We're just traveling through. That's why Paul, when he writes to the Hebrews that are scattered abroad at, at, during the persecution of the first century, he said, listen, lay aside every distraction, every weight, every sin that does so easily beset you and run the race, because it is a race, it's a beginning and an end to this race, run the race that has been set before you with endurance. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of your faith. Because our hearts are not to be troubled. He's coming back for his bride. He's going to take us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this seven-year period that we talk about in Revelation from chapter 6 to chapter 18, listen, all of that is going to take place here while we're in the mezzanine. Let no man deceive you. He saved you. You're not appointed unto wrath. He's coming for his bride before that last 70-week vision of Daniel kicks over, and it's about Israel. It's not about the church. We are a mystery hidden in times past. There are no Hebrew roots. Listen, we're not Hebrew. We're Gentiles saved by grace. We're not God's people of the Old Testament given the law. Listen, we have nothing to do with the law. The law was only to show us that we had dirt on our face. It couldn't remove it. It's the schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Listen, we're the church. We're separate. We're mutually exclusive from Israel. Two different people groups. Oh, and by the way, the church is the ruling class in heaven, not Israel. Israel is the wife of God. Listen, the church is the bride of Christ. Oh, and there's another group there that come out of the tribulation. They will serve around the temple. So there's three groups in heaven. You read it in Revelation. They have three different songs and three different positions in heaven. But you and I are promised by Jesus to rule and reign with Christ, to be seated on his throne as he's seated on his father's throne. We get to wear the Stephanos in heaven, the victor's crown. We're the bride of Jesus Christ. 
and our bridegroom is going to come for us, and then he's going to deal with the wickedness of this world. He's going to take us home. Can I get an amen? He says, so, yes, you can applaud that. That's where we're going, gang. And I think it's soon. Let no man deceive you by any means. Whether they're prophesying or thinking that, you know, they have a better insight. I have so many people have passed through this church that said, you know, God gave me a special insight that nobody else has. Uh, do you want to know what it is? No. Do you want me to explain it? No. Well, why? Because it's false. No prophecy is any private interpretation. If God wanted me to know it, he already wrote it down. You don't have some special insight. And then I've had people come through, this, these wackadoodles. Oh, I got this special insight. And so God hid all of the truth from the whole church, all of these centuries, and gave it to you. How arrogant. How prideful. No, Amos chapter 3, verse 7 says that the Lord our God does nothing till first he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Everything we need to know about end time uh, prophecy, everything we need to know about eschatology has been revealed. We just have to study it. And so Paul says, man, I don't want any man to deceive you by any means. Now watch as he lays out the chronology. Very important for us. For that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come except there come, and the idea is come first, a falling away, he puts first at the end, and the man of sin revealed the son of perdition. In other words, the church is going to fall away from the biblical faith. It will be in a state that is prepared, as it were, because of deception, because they don't love the truth, because they've set aside the teaching of God's word expositionally, line upon line, precept upon precept, building the foundation of the Old Testament, New Testament, and the teachings of Jesus under the feet of the church, because they are primed for deception, then the Antichrist, the wicked one, will come and he will deceive them. You see, that's why Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Isn't that an amazing question? Biblical faith. Biblical faith. Will I find that when I return? The first thing Jesus said in Matthew 24 concerning the last days is deception. And we're going to find out when we go through this chapter, the way not to be deceived is to know the truth, to love the truth, to study the truth, to, to, to grasp the truth, to lay hold of the truth, to guard the truth, to hide God's word in your heart. And we're going to see this morning that, listen, what's happening in churches today is the same thing that's happening in our school system that's happening in our culture. We're no longer objective, we're subjective. What does that mean? Subjective means it's your opinion, your feelings. Objective means you study the facts. When I was in school, I was taught to be objective. Today they're taught to be subjective. And they say things like, well, that's your truth, but this is my truth. There's one truth. And it's not progressive, and it cannot be changed. The Bible says of itself that not one jot nor tittle. Those are the smallest little markings in the Hebrew Bible that change the meaning of a letter or a word. Not one jot nor tittle will pass away to all of it be fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word remains forever. In fact, in Psalms 138, verse 2, God says, I honor my word above my name. And his name, listen, is to be honored. Would you not say that? In fact, there's only one name given. In heaven and earth, among men, whereby we must be saved. And that's the name Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ of the Bible. The eternal word who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death, rose again the third day, ascended to the Father, and is now there making intercession for us. And what he purchased for us is the gift of eternal life through his grace. That's the gospel. And we're warned not to be deceived. And so many of the church, if they're not being deceived, they're not being taught. But they are asleep in the light. And they're not watching. They're not anticipating. Jesus said, I'm coming for a church that is watching. I'm coming for a church that is sober-minded, that's anticipating with bated breath. Listen, they're like the, 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 the five wise virgins that have gone out with extra oil. We're not asleep concerning the times we're living in. He says, but let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come till first there's a falling away. Look around at the condition of the church today. Number one question asked of Berean Call. 
the discernment ministry has been around since Dave Hunt. Number one question, and they get thousands of emails a week. Number one question, where can I find a Bible teaching church? Our church used to be a Bible teaching church, and then our pastor retired, or he passed away, and we got a new guy, and it's everything but Bible teaching. He's turned our sanctuary into like a nightclub with all the lighting and the smoke machines, and it's all about experience. It's all about feeling. You know, we, we, get, we get these little sermonettes to Christianettes, and, 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 and the teaching of the Word of God has been replaced with this nonsense. Where do we find one? I had a guy from Ottawa, Ontario, who's tuning in us to say, is there a church like this up there? I used to be able to say, check out a Calvary Chapel. I can't even do that anymore. Because we're in the time of a falling away. Not from church attendance. Not from building big Ephesus and having mega churches. We're falling away from the simple teaching of God's word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And by the way, we're required to study as workmen, to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And so he says, first there's going to become a falling way. Let me give you a few more verses to prove this, that I think it's important that we establish this point, that we're living in a time. You know, we, we got the guy over there in Texas, has the largest church in America, 50,000 people. And he's telling those people that their best life is now. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul standing before those people and saying, hey, don't worry about heaven. Don't worry about eternal life. Hey, your best life is now. And smile at them. Can you imagine? No, can you imagine Jesus Christ saying that? No, Paul said things like, listen, set your affections on things above, not the things of this earth. Because your life is dead, it's hidden in Christ. So when Christ returns, who is your life, you will be found in him. Paul said, again, lay aside every sin and distraction and wait that this will easily beset you. Run the race with endurance. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The early church knew nothing of the things we're seeing passed along today as sermons from pulpits. And so Paul has to write, man, there's going to be first a falling away from the biblical faith. Listen, uh, nowhere in the New Testament are we promised in the last days another great awakening or revival. Now, we're praying for that here in our church, that, that there is a remnant that should be awake. There are those that God knows that will be awake, that are on the narrow path. But we're not promised a worldwide revival. In fact, we're promised the opposite of that, that there will be deception and there will be a falling away from the biblical faith. Here's what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He said, now the Spirit speaks expressly. That word is expressly means concisely, accurately, and he keeps on warning us. That in the latter times, and we've already established that that's always a reference when you read it in the Scripture, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, latter times is always a reference to the time just before Jesus returns, first to take away His church, and then secondly to establish His millennial reign. That's always a reference in Scripture, if you're a Bible student, to this particular time that I think we're living in. He said, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart. Some, not all. There's still lots of churches like ours around this nation, around the world. Uh, we get four hits on every one of our Bible studies every week from Iran. We get seven in China. We're in 25 different countries. People are downloading. Listen, and if they were caught in Iran downloading our messages, they would be put to death. Because it would be a sin against Allah and Islam. But there are people that are... Did you know one of the greatest rival, revivals happening in America, I mean in America, in the world today, is in Iran? Christ, the testimonies are coming out of Iran that Christ himself is actually appearing to them in visions and dreams, and they're turning to Christ by the thousands living in the last days. But the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. The idea is the biblical faith. And they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared 
with a hot iron. That would be the condition. And then he says this in 2 Timothy. Let me read it to you because I want to read all 17 verses. Can I do that for you this morning? Hang on. We got, we got, this is a marathon. This is not a, a sprint. We'll get as far as we can go and then we'll have communion. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says this, starting in verse 1. Know this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. We're not promised an easy time. We're prom in fact, Jesus said, listen, in the last days, you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. He didn't promise easy times, but listen, as you study through the Bible, one of the exercises I had to do when I was in Bible college is I had to go through every different revival that's happened from church age, first century to the modern centuries. And every one of them started with the persecution, repentance, a clear understanding of sin, a work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it was said of the early church that the blood of the saints was the seedbed of the church. You know, persecution has a way of refining. It has a way of recalibrating your compass. It has a way of tuning you into the things that are important. Amen? You can even see it in your personal lives. And someone in your, in, your, in your family gets cancer. Man, their prayer life goes off the charts. All of a sudden, they're more heavily minded than they've ever been earthly minded. Because eternity becomes real. And so he tells us, he said, listen, perilous times shall come for men. Then he describes. Now, now, as I'm reading through this, and I'm just going to read through it, try not to give too much commentary. Just ask me, does this read like our culture today? Now, I want you to think back just to the 60s, early 60s, late 50s. Some of the TV shows that we used to watch, Leave it to Beaver. Um, Andy Griffith. There was morality there. Um, there was a sense of, of shame for sin. Uh, every one of those programs ended with some kind of a moral, as it were, um, idea that was put forth for a moral society. But he says, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Opie would have never been disobedient to Andy. Beaver, he would get in trouble. He would confess. You know, Ward would take him into the, to the little library and they would have conversations and Wally would confess too. I mean, there was something about that culture, that time. Not disobedient to parents. Unthankful. There's a sense of entitlement in this culture today. Unthankful. Unholy. Man, there, there is a, listen, believe me, you can look it up. Here in Nevada Union High School, as one of the after-school curriculums, there is a club of Satan where a great number of kids meet after school to study witchcraft and Wicca. That, that's in our community, in this little sleepy town. Unholy, without natural affections. What does that mean? Men with men, women with women. And then, just not even to have the compassion one human being would have for another. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Incontinent in the old King James would mean just no self-control. Feels good, do it. Fierce. You know, you, you, you saw just recently that there was a protester that fired on the police. They fired back um, in defense. And this protester was killed, and now they're burning down the city. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. You know, it used to be that you could have a conversation with somebody if they weren't saved and you were saved, and it would be civil. Not anymore. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They know nothing of the cross. They know nothing of denying themselves and taking up their cross and following Jesus Christ. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of... Having a form of godliness. You know, Jesus said, when I return, many will come to me to judge them on that day and say, Lord, Lord, haven't I done all of these things in your name? Haven't I done, you know, all of these humanitarian things? And they'll list a whole bunch of works. And Jesus will say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. All you had was religion. 
Oh, and by the way, religious people crucified me. I came to own your heart. I came for you to be born again by the Spirit. I came to live in you and you to live in me, that you would abide in me and I would abide in you. It's relational. It's not religion. And he's going to say, listen, having a form of godliness. Well, they go through the motions. They pay their tithe. They go to church on Sunday. They dress up real nice and they play the act. They put on a mask. The Bible calls it, well, the very word for actor in the Greek is hypocrisy. You put on a mask. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The power to do what? To change your life. The power of the Holy Spirit to bring sanctification to you since you have already been justified. And it says, now listen to this. From such you turn away. You come out from among them and be separate, as he tells the church in Corinth. You touch not the unclean thing, and God will be your father, and you'll be his sons and daughters, and he will put his hand a blessing upon you. We're to have nothing to do with this world, gang. We're new creatures in Christ. We put off the old man. We put on the new man. And we're in the process. Can I get an amen? Of putting away sin. And it's a daily process, is it not? Amen. Just when you think you got the screws all nice and tight on the coffin, you find out that your old man has a screwdriver too, and he's trying to turn the screws back up to get back out. And it's a constant battle. And some days you have to have two screwdrivers in your hand because he's at it. Listen, um, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power of the Holy Spirit from such turn away. For of this sort are they that creep into houses, see they're creeps. And they lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away by diverse lusts, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning about their 16 tenets of the faith at a religious position, whether they're Catholics or, or Baptists or Assemblies of God or Pentecost, ever learning, but not coming to this. Such as, and now, and it's interesting here in verse 8 that we actually get the names of the two um, magicians that were before Pharaoh's court that tried to oppose Moses. You don't get it anywhere else. Paul introduced, he said, as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Now he's talking about them. Now watch us. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Listen, church. Don't listen to those people. You have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my love, my patience, the persecutions and afflictions that came unto me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecution I endured. But out of it all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall have a blessed time, live in a big house, be healthy, blessed in, in, in every way. Is that what it says? No, this life, if you're living it right before Christ, the spirit of this world is going to hate the spirit of, that's in you, the, the Holy Spirit. You are going to be what? What is the next word? Say it loud. Say it loud. What are you going to be? If you live godly and you call sin what it is and you profess the truth and you say you believe the Bible, you are going to be what? That's what it says. I just read it to you. You just said it. Now we're responsible to it. But evil men and seducers will act worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou. Now he's speaking to us. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. And hast been assured of knowing of whom you have learned them. And from a child, he's telling Timothy, thou hast known. Man, Timothy had a grandma and a mom that just put the word of God in them, in him. Having known as a child the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, watch the next two verses. Very important because Paul's gonna, Paul is going to bring this to the fore in this chapter. He says, all scripture. And if you don't mind biking up your Bible, and put the word graphy there. He doesn't say that all of these men were inspired. He said what they wrote was inspired. 
So God was able to control these men to the degree that when they put pen to paper, what they wrote was holy writ. All graphy is given by the inspiration of God. Literally, it reads in the Greek, all writing, God breathed. That's why I trust this. I don't, people ask me, well, have you ever read this guy's book? No. Well, would you read it? No. Well, why won't you read it? Because I'm still working on one book. Because this book was written by God. The best book that a man would write is only written by man. This is inspired. This is inerrant. This is authoritative. I, I told you my testimony when I first began to think that the, my life was messed up and I needed something. I thought I needed religion. And so, you know, I studied with the Jehovah's I studied with the Mormons. And then I found out they were just whacked as I was. And so I just tried to read the Bible. And I tried to read it like a book. You know, you start in the beginning and you read to the end. And it made me mad. It disturbed me. Especially when I got into the New Testament, it disturbed me. And later after I got saved, I realized it disturbed me because like no other literature that I'd ever read, and I was a reader, man, I loved to read. But like no other literature I ever read, it acted like it had the authority to tell me how to live. I didn't like that. Because it's, it speaks in those terms. All graphy, God breathed. All writing, God breathed. And it is profitable for doctrine, Reproof, correction, and instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. How do we become deceived? We abandon the teaching of God's word. Let me give you one more, Second Timothy, because we're talking about this falling away, and I want you to see as clearly as you can this morning that we're in that time. We're in that time. You know. I, 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 no, I'm not going to do that. I was going to tell you, you know, tune into some of these other churches, these mega churches, and listen to what they're saying. Don't do that. Because then I would be advising you to listen to false teaching. Because I'm going to tell you, we've watched a few of them, and it's just like, and that's what people are hearing, calling that the Word of God. There are pastors, listen, take my word for it, will get up, and they don't bring a Bible, they bring their phone, and they'll take a movie. And they'll, a secular movie, a carnal movie, and they'll try to make spiritual application to a secular carnal movie. I'm telling you, this stuff happens. Why don't you just open this? And why don't you just, if you can't understand it, read it to the people. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. It amazes me. But look, one more verse, and then we'll move on. You know, Paul's coming to the end of his life. He knows that he's about to pass the baton, as it were, to Timothy. He has left young lieutenant, and he says, I charge thee before God. This is serious, Timothy. I'm charging as though we were standing before God. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge one day. One day, every pastor, every minister, every elder, every Sunday school teacher or Bible teacher, every missionary is going to stand before God and give an account for what they have taught. Amen? That's serious, isn't it? Should that not put the fear of God in us? I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who should judge the, the living and the dead. That's what quick is. Not, not that they're fast and dead because if, you, if you're, you're dead, you're not fast. The living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Proclaim the word. Be instant in season and out of season. When people want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it. You know, and, and, and we found in these last days that people won't come out for a two-hour Bible study. You know, when, when Calvary Chapel got started, Chuck would teach in a kerosene-heated, smoke-filled tent that was packed with hippies that hadn't had showers that week for two hours. And nobody got up to go to the restroom. Because you could cut the Holy Spirit with a knife as God's word was being ministered. And it didn't go into our heads, it went into our hearts. He said, listen, preach the word, do it when they want to hear it. Oh. 
Am I on? Okay. Do it in season, out of season. What do you do? You reprove. You see, we're living in a time where nobody wants to be reproved. You reprove people. The word reproves is meant, you know, when you're reading through the Bible, when you're studying it, when you're hearing it taught, doesn't the Holy Spirit convict you? Reprove, he says, and rebuke. If the reproving doesn't stick, then rebuke. And not only rebuke, exhort, challenge them with all long suffering. And what's the next word? If I, doctrine. If I hear one more time, and I hear it all the time, and I'm talking to pastors, even Calvary Chapel pastors, and they say, well, we don't study doctrine here because doctrine is divisive. If I hear that statement one more time, I'm going to lose my mind. But it is a true statement. Doctrine is divisive. Did you know that? It separates the unsaved from the saved, the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goats. Because we're called to have a systematic theology. That's why a number of years ago, every Monday night, for I think nine months, we did a doctrines class here where we taught you theology, we taught you Christology, pneumonology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit, soteriology, how you're saved, ecclesiology, what the church is about, and eschatology, where the church is going, so that you would have a foundation under you. But he says, listen, you do this with all long suffering and doctrine. Now watch again the pronouns. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they will heap themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But thou, but watch thou. Now he's talking to Timothy. There's a line of demarcation here. And it's still in today. You have the they and they have the us. You have the them and you have the we. And the we is the church, the true church. The they are not the contenders, they're the pretenders. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, because you're going to be afflicted if you stand for the truth. Do the work of an evangelist, may full forth of your ministry. And then Paul goes on to say, for I am now ready to be offered up. My time of departure is at hand. Boy, I guess he went to that Appian way when they chopped off his head with a smile on his face. Man, I get to go home. And then he says, I fought a good fight. In the Greek, it's I agonized a good agonizome. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I never gave up. And I kept, I defended and guarded the faith. Henceforth, listen carefully to this last verse, verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. And listen to this. And not only me, but unto all them, listen carefully, also that, what are the next three words? Love his appearing. Oh, we've heard that all of our life. You know, our fathers have told that. Chuck's been teaching that back in the 60s and 70s that Jesus could come in any moment. We're not listening to that garbage. We're not listening to that stuff. Jesus is not coming. Our lives are just going to go on every day like they've always gone on. You do not love his appearing. You're too connected to this world and not that which is to come. Be careful. Because here we are told in the last days, there's going to be a falling away from the biblical faith. A falling away from the study and the uh, applying of God's word to our lives. A looking for and hastening unto the coming of the Lord. What was evident in the first century church, he's saying, will not be evident in the 21st century church. And so he's warning them. He's saying to them, listen, before... The Antichrist can be revealed. He said, first, there's going to be a falling away. Listen, the church is going to be so weakened. We'll, we'll read in a few moments. Oh, man, we're almost, I got to what, three verses? I just got to get through a couple more verses and then we'll have communion. We'll pick this up. We'll take a bite at a time. They will be in such a weakened condition when it comes to Bible truth that they're not going to understand. They will be deceived. That's not you, that's not me, that's them and they. Amen? We're called to know these things. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away. In fact, the word for falling away is apostasy in the Greek. We get the word apostasy from that. That literally means moving away from the biblical faith. And the man of sin be revealed, 
the son of perdition. Then the Antichrist can come to the fore because now what is called the church is primed for deception. He's going to talk about that later on in the chapter. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God, listen carefully, setteth in the temple. This is the third temple that's about to be rebuilt, the temple of God, showing in himself to be God. Jesus said, beware when you see the de abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Because he will defile that temple three and a half years into it. Um, probably offer pig's blood on the altar. And the eyes of Israel will be open, and they'll realize they had crucified the Messiah. And then they're going to flee to Petra, to Jordan, where God will protect them from the last three and a half years. Now let's just do two more verses, and then we'll come back and look at this again next week. So we know, listen, that first what must take place is the church has to be in a weakened state concerning the word. He's going to make that clear as he walks through the text. And then the man of sin, who will be the deceiver, will show up. Who opposes himself and exalts himself that all is called God. And he says this in verse 5. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. They had a clear understanding of this. And verse 6 says, and now you know. Now you know. You should understand completely. Listen carefully. Now you know what withholdeth. There's something restraining, as it were, this man of sin from being revealed. Now, he will come in a time when the church is in a weakened state that's not standing on the word. He will show up. But there's something that is still restraining him to the very moment where he's a, he appears. And you know what it is that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. There's a moment when he's going to come to the fore. In fact, they're telling us in Israel today, the rabbis are, that this man called the Yanuka, the Messiah, is going to be revealed in 2023. I find that interesting. Acquiring minds need to know. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. You see, they were saying, look it, we're already in a tribulation. Look what's going on. The Romans are hunting us Christian downs and feeding us to lions and using us for fodder in the arenas and they're murdering us. No, that's just persecution. That's your run of the mill, this world hating you because you love Jesus. That's, that doesn't come from God. That comes from the world and from Satan. And so they said, but, you know, that's already at work. Only, notice he, please, if your Bible has it capitalized, it has it right. If it doesn't, it has it wrong. And mine had it wrong and I had to correct it because it's in the masculine gender. He. Now, what you need to know and what the church fails to understand today is that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God the Father, masculine. God the Son, masculine. God the Holy Spirit, always in the masculine. So this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Or are you saying, Pastor, the Holy Spirit will be taken out in the last days? No. He'll still be at work. We're going to have two prophets show up. We're going to do signs and wonders. We're going to have 144,000 anointed, you know, 12 from each 12,000 tribes of Israel, you know, Holy Ghost filled, anointed evangelist speaking during the seven years. There's going to be a work that goes on because if there wasn't the Holy Spirit here still present during the tribulation, then nobody could get saved. There wouldn't be that great multitude that comes out of the tribulation washing their own garments. But I want to make the point that He has a particular reference to something. For the mystery of Nicodemus, only he who now restrains, will restrain, that's the word for the lead if you've got an old King James, until he be, now notice carefully in the next words, taken out of the way. Not taken through, not involved in. But there's something that is restraining, and we're going to end with this thought, there's something that is restraining all out wickedness and lawlessness in this world, and it will continue to restrain until it is taken out of the way, and then, he says, listen carefully, shall the wicked one be revealed. Now, what is it that's restraining? It's us. Well, how do you say that, Pastor? Matthew 24. We're still in the chapter that begins with the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the world? We're, we're in that chapter where he's answering those questions. And when he comes to verse 15 and 16, he says, 
When you therefore, well, excuse me, wrong verse, wrong verse, wrong verse. I wrote down the wrong verse. Well, I'll just quote it to you. I know it by memory. You are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? You know, I had a grandma that believed in salt. I had a grandma that believed in methylate, not mercurcom. Now, it, it, I will date you when I say that. And they lived on a small farm. And when we grandkids would go visit, if we got hurt, my grandmother had a big bag under her sink of rock salt. She would latch onto you with a grip that you could not get loose of. She would jerk you up, reach into that cabinet, pull out rock salt, and slap it on your wound. And you thought you were going to heaven. Man, you, you would dance around and scream and yell. And when that finally came to an end, then she would snatch you up again and into the bathroom, not methylate, not mercurical, methylate. She'd put that on your wound. Because she would always say, I don't want you to get an infection. Because salt has an antiseptic effect. It stops the putrefication of infection. You, us, the church, you're the salt of the earth. But he also makes mention, but if the salt loses its saltiness, do you know salt can lose its saltiness? Do you know how salt is formed? It's formed around particles of lime. And the flakes connect to it. And if you dilute it enough... If you water salt down enough, all you have left over is lime. And if you throw lime out on grass, what does it do to grass? You become of no use but be thrown out under the pathways of men. You lost your saltiness. And yet, that which should be salt today called the church doesn't eat like salt. <laughs> They don't want to hear it straight. They don't want it to sting. Listen, I thank God that every time I read his word, it stings. So you, you, some of you guys have gone here and said, man, that was so convicting. Well, study it for 15 hours. You only get it for one. And you get convicted. And you are the light of the world. What does light do? It dispels darkness. Have you ever gone into a lighted room, and when you open the door into a dark room, have you ever had darkness come in and overtake the light? No, you're the light of the world. You expose, and light is always an allegory in the New Testament for truth, for righteousness, for holiness, for godliness. Jesus was the light of the world. And your job in this life is to dispel darkness everywhere you go. Your job is to slap the salt on them so that they don't get infected with the things of this world. But if your life is so diluted and so watered down, listen, Jesus is warning us because that will be the condition of the church. There'll be no sting in the pulpit. Jesus is saying, when I come back, when there ought to be. You are to reprove, correct, rebuke, and comfort with all long-suffering and doctrine. The job of the pulpit, the job of the pastor, the job of the under-shepherd, the job of the Christian, the job of the elders of this church is not to see how many people we can get in a building, but how many people we can get into heaven. And my statement has always been, I don't care about having the biggest church in any town that I've ever pastored at, but I want the emptiest church one nanosecond after the rapture. Amen? So watch what Paul is saying, and we'll end with this. He's saying, listen, here's the chronology. Let no man deceive you because deception will be afoot concerning the coming of Christ. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day cannot come till first the, 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 the church becomes biblically illiterate. And in a position that because they have not loved the truth or latched on to the truth, as he's going to tell us later on in the chapter, that they could be deceived. But then he talks about, now listen, that shouldn't be your condition. Because that which restrains will continue to restrain until. Until it goes through the tribulation or goes halfway through the tribulation. No, until it is taken out. Harpazo, out of the way. Now let me ask you a question, you Bible-believing Christians, those who stand up for morality, those who stand up for holiness, those you men who bring that into your home, those grandparents who bring that to your grandchildren, those who believe every word of God, who try to do their best to live it. Let me ask you a question. What would this world look like 
tomorrow if we were gone today. Think about it. What would this world look like tomorrow when the salt and light is gone today? Do you think there might be all deception and deceivableness and lying signs and wonders? We'll get into that next week. If the church in America was gone tomorrow, then every one of your constitutional rights would be taken away because America will never come under the authority of a one world government until the Constitution is removed. And all of the liberals who just want to get with the program would be in control, and there would be no America as we know it. There would be a one world government that's being formed in Europe right now. The man of sin would be revealed, the Antichrist, and we would be in the mezzanine looking down and saying, my, my, my. Lying signs and wonders. Deceivableness of unrighteousness. And if they only would have loved the truth and have known the truth. My job, whether you like it or not, is to tell you the truth. And the truth is that you must be born again. And if you're born again, then there's a new spirit in you. And the moment you get born again, God dips his pen in the blood of his son and he writes your name in a very special book. Because you have passed from death to life, from darkness to light, from judgment to everlasting life. And you're left here, as we study ecclesiology, you're left here for one purpose, to be salt and light. In fact, do you know that you have a commandment that is on you? And by the way, he hasn't taken it from you. And you better have another commandment that replaces it if you think that this is not the commandment. When Jesus left, the last thing he said to the church was what? Go. Go where? And to all the world. We kind of had it backwards. We started in India, and then we went to Africa, then we went to Belize. Now we're here. We spent all our money over there. Now we're spending it on radio here. Because America is the greatest mission field in the world today. Africans used to chase us down when they saw a Bible in our hands. So show me the gospel. And we've had people fall on their face when they actually got to read it for themselves and confess Christ as their Savior. You walk downtown with a Bible in your hand today, people don't run to come and ask you. They run away from you. Amen? Listen, we're going home soon. And if you think this world's a wreck today, wait till we're gone. But until we are gone, we must go into all of this world and preach this gospel to every living creature. And what is the gospel? Not God is mad at you. He's not. The gospel is good news. Listen, Jesus Christ came in the form of a man, God's own son. He took upon himself your sin, my sin, our sin. He nailed it to his cross to never be brought before you again. And all you have to do is come and confess him as your Lord and Savior. Believe what he said in his word. Be born again by the Spirit. Your names will be written down indelibly in a very special place. And I don't believe you can send away your salvation once you're born again. This nonsense of losing your salvation means you never had it. Let me make it clear. If you are born again by the Spirit of God, you will never be anything but born again. Because his seed, John said, will remain in you. Oh, you'll get spanked. You'll go to the, to the woodshed many, many times. How many have been there this week? But he never tells you, change your name, pack your bags, and get out of here. Because what he begins, he finishes. Amen? Now unto him who's able to present you and me faultless, not us, him, before the Father of glory with exceeding joy. On this five-point Calvinist that God chooses some to be saved and some to be damned, life from the bit of hell, doctrines of demons, why would you say that? Because my God is not that way. He wouldn't send me to a devil's hell by something I didn't cause. Did any of you guys cause your sin? David said you were conceived in it, born in it. You came in here with a sin nature, and listen, you proved that you had a sin nature later by your choices. If God didn't give you a way out, why do you think over and over, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, it doesn't say might be or could be, it says shall be saved. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be what? Saved. How do we know we're saved? Because we're new creatures in Christ. We don't love sin like we used to love sin. We want to get doesn't mean we don't sin, is that we we our hearts are not for that anymore. We wrestle with it, we struggle with it. And all these false teachings come. I have people say, Well, if you're not a Calvinist, you must be an Arminist. I'm neither. Well, what are you? I'm a biblicist. I just believe what the Bible says. 
And the Bible says that if I come to Jesus, see, the question never should be, you know, do you believe in eternal security? Are you, are you eternally secure in Christ Jesus? Yeah, it's in Christ Jesus, not are you eternally secure. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, that shouldn't even be a question. Amen? And what God began in you, as dumb as we can be, and we can be pretty dumb. You know, there's a reason why he calls us sheep. My sister used to raise sheep. That is the dumbest animal on the planet. No, they're dumb. You know, a sheep will actually follow a goat. In fact, most sheep herders get a goat for the stupid sheep to follow. Because don't follow this goat. Follow this word. Amen? Be a good sheep. Be a Berean sheep. But I'm telling you right now, with all the authority I can muster from the Bible, you and I are living in the latter days. And we're seeing the deception take place in the church. And it's being primed, as we're going to see next week, for lying signs and wonders. And people will be deceived. But he's going to say, but you, brethren, not them, you. I have confidence in you that you are walking in the Spirit, and you're loving the truth. Amen? Amen? That's us. How far?